Centripetal force. Huzzah. Yay. So what did the word centripetal mean? Rotations. Revolution. Oh, to the earth. <laughs> to, to the that part, right? Toward the center. Yeah. Centripetal means toward the center. So we're going to be looking at centripetal force here. Now, a first and important thing is that centripetal force isn't an actual force. Centripetal force is the name we give to the net force toward the center. So whatever is applying that force is the actual force. So the example, what was my favorite demonstration of all time? Yes. So when I swing this around, or yeah, swing around my head, what is what forces are acting on the stopper? Acceleration, strain. Okay, is not a force. Uh, gravity. Okay, there's gravity, which is acting in what direction? Down. Down. Okay, what else? Um, the force that you're putting into swinging in the kinetic friction or whatever it is. Okay, there would be some air resistance. We're going to ignore the air resistance, but it would be there. What was it? Uh, no. Six point. No, what is that thing? The times 10 to the negative 11. I'm not sure off the top of my head, but there is a, a very significant force without which this thing would not be going in a circle. What's keeping it going in a circle? Oh, that's the centripetal force. What force? Remember, centripetal force is not an actual force. It's the name for the sum of the forces toward the center. That would be velocity, right? Velocity is not a force. I, I'm glad I'm asking these questions because as we get those wrong answers out, we learn things. That was gravity, you already got that. We have gravity and we have air resistance. There's another one that's extremely significant. It would not go in a circle without this. Normal force? Normal force is a contact force to keep it from going through a surface. So that's not torque. critical here. What? Torque? Um, torque is actually, my arm's getting tired. <laughs> torque is not a force. Torque is the rotational equivalent to a force. Torques are caused by forces. Work is another thing. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, it's the tension and the strain. Oh the tension and the strain, what direction does the force of tension always point? Inward. Away. Away from the object in the direction the strain is going. So it has a tension that's pulling it in. And that is what is making it constantly change directions to go in a circle. So we're going to explore this today. And we're going to focus on the calculus first, then we'll go to, once we have the calculus, we establish what the relationship is, and then we're going to go to the simple situations where you don't need calculus, but you needed it to understand this, or to make it easier to understand. So, and I'll draw, come on, I'll draw a figure to go with that. Now this here, I just made up that omega, and then I did calculations, and as I was telling David, it's impossible. So somebody grab your phone, go to your timer. And we'll just count off or measure the time it takes to do like 10 circles and then we'll divide by 10. I got stopwatch. Stopwatch. I got it. Okay, so I'll tell you when to start stop, okay? Start. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Stop. 7.56. 7.74. Okay, so halfway between there, 7.65 roughly. Yeah. Um, so we're going to say that the period is 7.65 seconds, whoops, divided by 10, because we did it for 10. Now we're going to go into something that of course, I intended to talk about yesterday in class, didn't get there, so it's going to be covered in class tomorrow. <clears throat> and is that 10 supposed to be 9.8? No, that 10 is 10. We did 10 complete circles. So that's the number of circles. So the period T is the symbol for period. It's the time for one cycle. And so I have the time for 10 cycles divided by 10 to get the time for one cycle period. Could we just use, instead of doing 9.8, could we just run up to 10? 
Um, no, no, that that's introducing a a fairly significant error in our answers, and we don't want to do that. Yeah. In, in introductory classes, you'll sometimes do that just so calculations are simpler. Um, as you've seen, some students still stick with nine point eight one. Like it's the correct value. I think the 9.81 is used just to make sure people use three sig figs instead of two. If you say 9.80, no, 9.80 is kind of like the average value in the U.S. No. What's the next digit? Well, 9.80 is an average here. It can vary between like 9.83 and 9.76 or so, depending on where you are. Um, so. We're not going to worry about going another digit beyond that. Okay, so we have the period. Now, we're talking about something going around a circle, and we have to learn some new ideas and terminologies. So one thing about going in a circle is how do we measure the position in a circle? What are some of the options that you're comfortable with? Uh, radius. Okay, we measure the radius. I was actually specifically trying to go toward the angle. Oh. Cosines. Yeah. We use cosines and sines to go between angle and Cartesian coordinates. Oh, you're talking about radians. Okay. We might measure angle in radians. Degrees. We might measure degrees. Do you know what the what the origin of the degree is? Zero. No. Okay. YouTube <laughs> origin is a different meaning than I did. <laughs> You took origin like the origin of the coordinate system. Oh. I mean, where does it come from? Uh, where, who originated it, how, when, and why? Well, we know that the Earth goes around the sun. And if you observe from the Earth, you would think the sun goes around the Earth, right? So I don't care about the terminology. We're talking about Earth-based observations of where the sun appears in the sky from the Earth. The fact that the Earth is going around it. The sun is what they look at. And so people would observe where the sun is in the sky every day. Now that seems hard, right? Because you can't see the stars. But it's not that hard because they weren't idiots. And so they knew that the sky had stars, and the stars were in a fixed relationship to each other. And so based on, you know, like the sun is setting over here, so this is opposite it, they calculate exactly where the sun is in the sky. Um, you know, the easiest way is, well, it's opposite this, opposite this. That way you can get it all straight in your head. So they track the sun, and of course we know that the sun, the sun, the Earth takes how long to go around the sun? 365.242 yes. days for the Earth to go around the sun. And so the distance that the, the sun moved against the celestial sphere, this here is the celestial sphere, so... How far the sun moved each day across this. Here's this here's the ecliptic, this is the path it takes. So how far it moved across this every day would be 1365.24 of a complete circle. And so they said that's approximately 1360. And 360 was thought to be a magical number because it pretty much is. Because it's evenly divisible by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, you gotta skip 7. 8, 9, 10, that's the 11, and 12. All but two numbers between 1 and 12 will evenly divide 360. So doing math with 360 is pretty easy. Why do you skip 7 and 11? Because, because it's, it's not, not divisible by 7 or 11. Oh. So that's how they came up with 360 degrees, one degree being the distance the sun moves each day. And 360 degrees, that would be an entire circle round 365.2422 to 360. That's where it comes from. It's when you when you think about it that way, you're like, well, okay, so it's not exactly the right number to begin with. And it's really nothing special except for hey, it was really easy to do math with. And, and I think we should appreciate easy to do math with, right? <laughs> what about the radian? Where's the radian come from? The radian means nothing. Radians means it's an angle in the natural unit, which is no units. Angles don't have units. 
But because we measure things in 360 degrees, we can't just say 360 because, yeah. So radians is the natural thing. Pi is defined as the ratio between the circumference and diameter of a circle. And for any arc length, so if I have something that goes around this much of a circle, here's my angle theta, here's my arc length s, here's my radius r, we have a simple relationship that says the arc length s is equal to theta r. And so, of course, what are the units for the arc length s? In SI, that would be? Well, it's a distance, so what's the SI unit for? Meters. And what would the unit for radius be? Also meters. Also meters. So that tells you theta has to have no units. And radians is the no units unit. And so in our equations, radians will appear and disappear because they aren't really units. Degrees can't appear and disappear because you have to convert to the radians and then you can have disappear. Do you have to tag on the pi? The well, the pi would be part of the angle, right? The angle, you know, if, it, if you do a complete circle, you've gone through two pi radians. So the circumference of a circle is two pi r. So why am I doing this now? Well, we need it. And... When we talk about rotation, we talk about an angular velocity. And the angular velocity is the angle per second. So here we've calculated that it does a complete circle, or we've measured, does a complete circle in 0.765 seconds. How much angle does it do in a complete circle? Goodbye. Right. And so... Omega is the symbol we use for the angular velocity. Well, omega. We'll, we'll use omega squared in an equation coming up, but omega is the, the symbol for angular velocity. And omega is going to be the change in angle over change in time. So for a complete circle, that's 2 pi radians divided by 0 0.765 seconds. So the angular velocity that we calculated for me swinging that thing around in the air. Is T, like capital T, is that tension? No, that was period. What? Period. Remember I talked about that, the time for it to do a complete rotation is the period. What are these called? Like, would you just, um, like variables for what? The, well, for something in circular motion. Yes. So my omega is 8.21 rads per second. You see that's significantly different than 3.0. I'll use 8.2 because I don't have that much significant figures anyway. The, well, you measured 7.65 seconds, but if, you know that's taking the average between the two is only 7.6. So 8.2 rads per second is the angular velocity we're going to use for today. Not the three that doesn't work. Okay, then I have a question on here. What's the equation for the position of an object if at time equals zero, the object is at 0.85 meters, that's the radius, and zero, that is x coordinate, y coordinate. So we're saying that at time equals zero, my object is right here. It's going to be rotating like this with angular velocity omega. What's the equation for the position? And I'm going to lead you through this. I'm not asking you to just answer right off the bat. So at some time t, I'm going to have the string like this, and there's my position. And my angle will be omega. Oh, boy, that didn't work. Zoom sesame. My angle here will be omega t because it's doing omega radians per second. If I multiply it by t, then the angle it will have made is omega t. So I have an angle of omega t. What is the x component here? Where should I draw the x component for this position right here? Okay, you went to where I'm going to go with the next question. Is it a horizontal or vertical line? 
horizontal. So it's going to be this is my X component. This is my Y component. It's a right angle. Notice my diagram did have X and Y defined, so I don't have any problems there. Uh, yes, yes, okay, Exxon. So, like what you just did, you didn't really draw a chord from the X axis up no. to the point. You did it from half. So uh, what, I, what, I, what I'm doing here is resolving this vector, if you will, into its components. Okay. So you don't want it to, like that green dot, to touch the purple dot? No, no. It's moved from the purple dot to that location. And I'm just looking for what are the coordinates for that location. Oh, I get to find the coordinates. So what is the x coordinate? The x coordinate is cosine wt. Okay. The radius, I forgot to write the radius in there. Radius, the radius times cosine, cosine of omega t. Omega. Omega. <laughs> and what is y? So if I want to write my position as a function of time, now that I've broken it into components, I can write that as position vector. So I'm going to use x vector here for my position vector. Well, what do you know? Would you get a second? Excuse me? You get the unit seconds from that? No, you don't get any units from that. I'm not yeah. sure what you're referring to. I mean, well, you actually get the units like from that. Like omega times time. Like omega t has units of... Omega is radians per second. T is seconds. So then I have units of radians, which is no unit for the angle. And I take the cosine or sine of that, which again has no units, multiplied by radius, which has units of distance. So my x has units of distance. Of meters? Yeah. Okay. So in the x direction, I have r cosine omega t. In the y direction, I have r sine omega t. Both have an r, so I'm going to factor it out. I'm going to zoom in so I can write a little more neatly again. And cosine omega t was in the x direction. Do you remember the symbol we use for the x direction? The unit vector? There are two options. I'm going to go. Uh, isn't it sub x or something? X indeed. Okay. You can either use x hat or you could use i hat. Oh, I Okay. I is what I did in my notes as well. And what about for the y direction then? And I don't know if Nathan is just copying it wrong or if that's the way his textbooks do it. He uses vector signs over the i and j. You really shouldn't because that hat means it's a unit vector. It has a length of one. If you put a vector sign over it, it could have a different length besides one. So it should have the hat. So there's my equation for the position as a function of time. As time increases, my x component, it starts at one, it goes down to zero, it goes negative, comes back. As time increases, the y component starts at zero, it goes up to one, comes back down. So it's alternating back and forth, and that's going to describe, that equation will describe my circle as time passes by. So that's describing the position of the bob as it goes around a circle. So here I just, of course, I knew where we were going. I, so we have this equation. Now we're going to use our calculus, right? There's been no calculus before this, and there'll be no calculus after this slide. This is the calculus. So how do I find the velocity as a function of time if I have an equation for the position as a function of time? And of course, I wrote it out, but I want you to just say the words. Take the, take the derivative, right. So take the derivative of this function. Now we're keeping to r constant. What? When, when I was preparing, I had r varying too, which, which you can do. To but, find what? Uh, so you take a derivative to find what? Take a derivative of this position equation with r and omega as constants. Okay, but that finds what? That finds the velocity. velocity. The derivative of position is velocity. So if r is a constant, what do I do with the r out front for this entire equation? Yeah. It just stays there. The derivative of distance is velocity? Yes. That's, that's what we have right here. Derivative of distance is 
plus. Okay, so what's the derivative of cosine omega t? I'm going to put the omega out front. Yeah. Omega sine omega the i hat remains i hat. Depending on the coordinate system you have, sometimes your unit vectors have a derivative. But if you're using Cartesian coordinates, your unit vector is zero, the unit vector is zero, so it's a constant. And so we have that for our i component. What about for our j component? Omega. I'm not sure what you mean. I didn't take I it. Omega. Sine, omega oh, okay. That that would be the chain rule. If we're doing the derivative of cosine omega t, let u equal omega t, and you have cosine u or co derivative of sine of u dt is derivative of sine of u du du dt. And so the du dt is where the Okay, so there we have our equation for velocity as a function of time. Now notice I can factor something else out besides the r. What else can I factor out? Yes. So there we have our, our velocity vector, either the blue one, which has R out front, or the red one. I didn't give myself space. I have the acceleration there underneath. So now we're going to do the acceleration. How is the acceleration? How do we find the acceleration? It's derivative of velocity. Yeah, and once again, I'm going to have it written there, but I just want to make sure we remind ourselves of the pathway, why we're doing things, not just... And then it took a derivative for some reason, you know. So we take the derivative. So I'm just going to stick with this form because it's the one I can see in its entirety. So omega is a constant, r is a constant. What's the derivative of sine omega t? Uh, times? Negative. Well, it's going to be negative, negative omega plus omega. Yeah, we're going to have to bring out, it's not... Okay, I, let me write stuff. So, so what's inside the brackets is going to be the derivative of sine omega t. Uh, then omega the cosine. Yes. Of omega t, actually. But I know you were going there. Too many letters and numbers. Okay, and then what about plus omega... Well, that definitely needs to be simplified, doesn't it? So I have omega times omega, and in fact, minus omega squared in every term in the parentheses. So I'm going to factor that out. So I'm going to have equals minus omega squared r, parentheses, cosine of omega t in the i hat direction, plus sine of omega t in the j hat direction. Yeah, maybe it stands for what again? Like, what is it in charge of? Omega was our angular velocity here. That is the, I, I brought it up here so you can see. So it's the purple arrow. That's the definition of omega. It's the change in angle divided by the change in time. Oh, okay. So it's the rate at which the angle is changing. Okay, so here are the two equations that we found. Position is a function of time, and acceleration is a function of time. We started this problem with the constraint of something going in a circle with constant radius and constant angular velocity or constant speed. So now we look at these, and what is cosine omega t i hat plus sine omega t j hat? What's the magnitude of that? How long is it? 
One, isn't it? It's one. Yeah. Because to find the magnitude of this, yeah. you take the i component squared plus the j component squared and square root. So I would have cosine squared omega t plus, plus sine squared omega t, which by definition is one. So this thing in parentheses has a magnitude of one, which is telling me the magnitude of my position is radius. It's always going to be one radius away. Well, I mean, I totally knew that, right? Right. So, so if we do this, if we do the magnitude of x is equal to the square root. And so the first term, I factored out the r, but I'll bring it in, will be r squared cosine squared omega t. The second term will be r squared sine squared omega t. And so I could factor out the r squared, right? And the square root of r squared is r. So I get to that, and then that whole thing inside the square root is 1, the square root of 1 is 1. So we have a magnitude of r for the, for the distance, which we expected because we said that as our initial starting point. It's doing a circle with a radius of r. Now, what about the acceleration? What's the magnitude of the acceleration? What's the magnitude of this thing in parentheses? One. One, right? Just because that's exactly the same thing. So the magnitude of the acceleration is omega squared r. So the acceleration necessary to stay in a circle is omega squared times r. We were able to do that just by doing our calculus to calculate what acceleration is. What's the direction necessary for that acceleration? Negative. It's negative whatever the direction for the x was. So if I have the things in this direction, then the acceleration has to be this way. So it's going in a circle. It's got to be pointing toward the center. And so there we've established it has to be toward the center. Hence our term centripetal, and it has to have a magnitude of omega squared times r. So that is what we call the centripetal acceleration, which we often write as a subscript c. Do we have to learn how to derive that for the test? Um, it is something that you could be asked to do in the test, yeah. Now, we often like to talk about things in terms of the speed rather than in terms of the angular velocity. And so let's go back to where we defined angular velocity. Omega is equal delta theta over delta t. But theta, if we just take this equation right here and solve it for theta, we have theta equals s over r, so delta theta should be delta s over r if r is constant. Now I'm doing all of this without calculus. That's kind of silly, isn't it? We're a calculus class. Let's change these deltas to what they really should be. What should they be? So if I substitute that d theta is ds over r, then omega is equal to ds over r divided by dt, which simplifies to 1 over r ds dt. But what is, okay, s was the is, arc length. Why isn't it dr? Okay. Well, r was a constant. We're doing it for constant radius only. So if we're doing constant radius, then theta is s over r, so d theta is just ds over r. You don't have any, any um, quotient rule to apply because r is a constant. What do we normally call ds dt, guys? Change in position over change in time. So ds over Okay, speed in this case. Um, I thought it was changing distance over time. 
S is distance. Though. Well, when we say over time, we mean over changing time. Over changing time. Yeah. So if somebody covers three meters in five seconds, then their average speed is the change in distance three meters over the change in time five seconds. Yeah. Or just, isn't distance and position a different thing on a graph? Um, they, there, there are some some nuances to the terms. Yes, but we're just making sure this. We're kind of using some distance. The, 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 well, the distance is the distance that it travels in going around the circle. So in my picture here, the distance from time equals zero to when it got there is this distance. That's the arc length s. Whereas the position was here or here. So the position is a different thing than the distance, and the displacement, of course, would be. The um, oh, what was the cord? Yeah, would be the cord going from starting to ending point, which is slightly different than the arc length. And we're correct by sticking with the arc length. And the change in arc length over time is what we would call the speed, because it's not a vector. And so it turns out that speed is, or excuse me, omega, the angular velocity, is just the linear velocity by the by the radius. Okay, so question. Well, it looks like arc. Is a vector, and whatever R would that be a unit vector? Um, like you just multiply it by a unit vector? In all the work I did, R was not a vector. R was simply the radius, oh, the saw. distance from the center to any point on the circle. Oh, that's why you didn't put it here. Okay. Yeah. So this is an important outcome right here. Omega is V over R. So if I have a wheel that is, you know, one meter in radius, that's a really tall wheel, <laughs> traveling at 10 meters per second, then its angular velocity would be that 10 meters per second divided by one meter to give me 10 radians per second. So you can translate back and forth. And we'll, we'll talk about this a lot more in class tomorrow. But we have now found that our centripetal acceleration is omega squared r, but using that conversion, since omega is v over r, that's v squared over r. So we have two equations that mean exactly the same thing that we'll use for centripetal acceleration, omega squared times r or v squared divided by r. And so in our calculus class here, we've shown where those come from without any flim flam or, or having to make approximations. It was all very straightforward. You just took the second derivative and outlet popped. That's, of course, the calculus today. Like I said, it was only on that one slide. Any questions about how calculus allows us to quickly and easily find centripetal acceleration? But could you have back to oh, the AC is B squared? Mm. Are you, are you feeling comfortable with the derivation? Obviously, we haven't used it yet, but with the derivation? I'm sure if I look over the slide, and just look at it. Yeah, you're going to have to have it sink in a little more. OK, <laughs> go ahead. Like, um, it's all raised to 2. Wouldn't r be squared 2? Yeah. It, well, you have r divided by r squared. r divided by r squared is 1 over r. You said b squared over r the v over r quantity squared yeah. times r so that gives you v squared over r squared times r one r cancels so for the rest of our work we're actually going to work with well i don't know which ones we're going to work with let's go to doing an actual we have two applications the first one a magic that doesn't occur remember instead of using three we're using 8.2 Radians per second there. So suppose I swing my mass equals 50 grams. I estimated, I didn't measure that. It, it, it turns out to make absolutely no difference to our problem. So I just look in, this is 20. Yeah, I think that's probably reasonably accurate. Yeah, definitely less than 100, more than 20. My 50 is missing from that set. So I swing it around a circle doing my 8.2 radius per second with a radius of 0.85 meters and the magic of it being staying perfectly horizontal. Now I can make that really happen if my table was big enough to make it you know, go around on the table. 
So you'll see problems in the textbook where they do that. You have a, a puck tied to a string with a hole in the center of the um, ice hockey, um, you know, whatever. So it's going in a circle, something like that. It's kind of contrived to make it so it's quiet. How do you, how do you find Pinterest? That's what we're doing. We're going to find it. That's our goal. So what is the tension in the string? When you look at a problem like this, you have to do some, some identification to get going. You have to say, what concept is involved here? So if we give you this information and say, what's the tension? What's the concept that you're thinking about? When it asks, what is the tension? What does that make you think of? Stress. Okay, static stress. Mm. What is it, it, it's something within the realm of dynamics rather than stats. I know you're a status class, that's what you're thinking. Like I think of like, what you need to train yourself to see is, oh, when it asks about the tension, that's probably directing me to Newton's second law. Right? That's one of the interpretation things that you have to to have down by the time test time rolls around or else you get a, a not you know, satisfactory score. How to identify what kind of problem, how to approach it. And of course, for this next test, you know what, every question almost is gonna be this, right? Because we're going through things one at a time, but we will have some that have kinematics as well. So you'll, you'll have to say, you know, first I'm gonna use Newton's second law and then I'm gonna use kinematic equations. Things are getting more complicated. So my idea, Newton's second law. So what's the first thing I do if I'm doing a Newton's second law problem? <laughs> draw a diagram is always a good answer. So I draw a picture. So in this case, Can't write omega. Okay, so there I have my diagram with all of the things I know for it. Here's the question. So I've got my diagram drawn. Now, what do I do with that? What is this out? Like, what are we looking at? Stop it. Yeah, that's the next question. We have, if we're using Newton's second law, we have to identify what is our object. And it's not the string. <laughs> it's the stopper. I, I laughed assuming you were joking, but I looked at you, you didn't have a smile. Now I feel really guilty. Why is it the string? Why is it not the string? Um, the, the simple answer is because I have no way to do the problem that way. Um, which, of course, you wouldn't know that offhand, right? The string in the physics approximation, the string has no mass, doesn't stretch, and thus the only things it does is transmit a force from point A to point B. Well, you and so the it. string is pulling on my hand, and I'm pulling on the string, and then the string is pulling on the stopper, and the stopper is pulling on the string. If I just look at the string, I have two of the unknowns. I don't know anything about what my hand is doing. It's, well, you can only okay. string and subtract it from. Well, that, that's going to a real case, and you still have the fundamental problems of not enough information. But if we make our object the stopper, that's the thing we have the information about. And so my object is the stopper. Um, a stopper is the thing that you put in the top of a bottle to stop it up. This is one. Yeah, like, well, like a cork stopper. This one here is a rubber stopper. <laughs> you can do lots of things with cork besides make a stopper. I hope I said cork instead of quark, because I think quark is what came out of my mouth. 
Okay, so my object is my stopper. Once I've identified this, the object, what was the reason to identify the object? Because I'm going to apply Newton's second law to it. And if I'm going to apply Newton's second law to it, I need to know the force it's acting on. So free body diagram. So in this picture, now remember, this is a magical picture. It's just perfectly horizontal. We're not going to have to worry about gravity because all of our motion is in the horizontal plane and gravity is in the vertical plane. So just looking at the horizontal plane, what forces are acting on the stopper? I said one word that is misleading in that, by the way. Or one letter that is misleading in that. It's the force. Instead of writing rate, ra, radian over second, can we just put like uh, pi over s? No, because pi is a number. Mm -hmm. We need it in radians per second, not... Right. If you put in pi per second, that would be a completely different value. Well, what would be the notation? RAD. What? RAD is the abbreviation for radian. Cool. So we have the force tension. That's the only force acting on it. What's the acceleration? Or negative, I guess. We're just looking at the magnitude, so we don't need to put them in negative sign. Oh, but so but keep going. Oh, okay. Omega squared R. Uh, let's see. And R. we only need the magnitude. Right, the rest of the stuff is giving us the direction part, which we said that had a magnitude of one. Yes. Oh, okay. So, yeah. so, so the magnitude of the acceleration is omega squared R. The, what you were reading was the acceleration vector, which is a perfectly correct answer to my question, mind you. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. If I would have said, what's the acceleration magnitude, <laughs> then we would have all been on, on board. I'm going to draw my axes, but I needed to do this first because how do you si decide the directions to draw your axes, to draw your coordinates? You want one direction to be parallel to the acceleration and one perpendicular. So in this case, my coordinate system at this instant is going to be something like this. And so I'll call this the tangential direction because it's tangent to the motion. And I'll call this the center direction because it's pointing toward the center. It's the centripetal direction. So I don't have x and y in this case. I have tangential and central. Now we apply Newton's second law, right? We did all of this so we could apply Newton's second law. I said we apply Newton's second law. We first should break into components, but we only have one force. Really not a lot of work to break it into components, especially since that force is in what direction? Towards the center. Towards the center. So we just do some of the forces toward the center is equal to mass times acceleration toward the center. By definition, this we call the centripetal force. Notice I did not have F sub C written on my free body diagram because it's not a force acting on my object. The definition of centripetal force is the sum of all the forces acting toward the center. So in this case, and this is a question I asked at the beginning, but Randy wasn't here yet. What is supplying the centripetal force? Mass and the acceleration towards the center. Okay. You both said what's in the equation, but what force on my free body diagram is supplying the force? The tension. The tension. So the force of tension, in this case, is the entire centripetal force. In cases like probably I'm going to do at the roller coaster in class tomorrow, you'll have a combination of force normal and force of gravity giving you the centripetal force. Right, so each, each problem is going to be different on what's providing the centripetal force. And centripetal force is the word for the sum of all of those toward the center. So taking from the words you just gave me, some of the forces toward the center is force of tension equals mass times the equation for centripetal force that Randy gave me, omega squared r. And so what's the force of tension equal to? And 
And can somebody go ahead and calculate that? Good, good. Notice the rads are not part of the units that David quoted because rad means there's no unit here, nothing to see. To correct sig figs, 2.9 newtons. So the tension in the string when I was swinging around is basically three newtons. Not very much. Now let's get real about this. Notice I said, hmm, magic has occurred. There's no way in the world that I can swing this around my head in a flat circle. Why not? Because gravity. Because gravity. Gravity is pulling down, so it's at some angle below horizontal. Mm -hmm. And so what we're going to do is say, okay, keeping the same string, so the same, now I change it from radius to length, because the radius is going to be somewhat smaller than the length, it's 0.85 meters, and keeping the same rate of rotation, how much is it really going to be dropping? What's the angle going to be? Well, if it had a constant acceleration, it would be a perfect circle. You know the force of the tension? Or the force of the string? You it's going to change. You have another dimension with the axis or something? The, the, the tension is going to change. So that's another thing we're going to calculate here. Of course, we only have four minutes left. Yes, Axon? You have to have like a constant angle throughout the whole thing. You know how the perfect Yes, it's going to have a constant well, downward angle. So what would act on that? If it's not acceleration, what would it be? Well, acceleration is not something that acts on things. Acceleration is something that they have because of what's acting on it, the forces. Um, and so the force of gravity is acting downward. Well, let's draw the free body diagram because we have the same principle, right? Still going to be a Newton's second law problem. Still need to identify our object as a stopper. And now a free body diagram is going to have to be something that has a little more to it. This view here still works for a top view. But if we look at a side view, we have... There's my, well, here's the stopper, and we have some angle theta that we're looking for. And if we draw the forces, we have the force of gravity going that way and the force of tension going that way. Now, if you look at this, what's providing the centripetal force? The force toward the center. The tension. The tension, but now we see... It's not all of the tension, it's only some of the tension. So it's force gravity plus force T is equal to our centripetal force. Um, we have to accompany it. That, that, that is true. And you can do this because we only have three things. You can either do it with geometry or break into components. I'm going to go ahead and break it into components just because I think I'm spending too much time on geometry and not enough in the components. So now we're going to decide directions, and I'm going to decide my directions like this. Use the resultant force. Uh, why? Okay. Um, you can, yes. You can do that. And you get the same answer. I did it both ways before class just to you know, make sure I was clear on both ways. But I'm going to break these into components. So I'm going to have toward the center and the y direction. Force of gravity. How much of the force of gravity is toward the center? None. None. It's all vertical. So how much of it is in the y direction? All of it. Not All of it, except for it is pointing down. down. So minus mg there. Okay, then the force of tension. How much of that is in the direction toward the center? All of it. All of it minus gravity. All of it minus theta. We have to break it into components. So it has one component that's like this and one component that's like that. So in the previous part, we found the magnitude of the tension. And well, in the, the break of the this, this is going to be a different answer completely. Oh. In the previous part, we had theta was zero. Right. And now we have realistic theta is zero. So what component is the horizontal portion, adjacent or opposite? Uh, opposite. opposite. Oh, uh, oh, horizontal. Yeah, horizontal is, I'm sorry, my hand was misleading. Yeah. 
I was trying to get up there, but I didn't want to. Yeah, anyway. Yes, it's the adjacent side. Which trig function relates adjacent with hypotenuse? So that's going to be force tension cosine of theta. And notice that's going to the left. Is that positive or negative? I defined it as positive. You have to look at your coordinate system, right? We fall into traps. We've always made positive to the right because I defined it. My coordinate system here has center is going to the left. Why would center? Because that is where the center is. Now, I could have drawn my picture 180 degrees later when, it, when the bob was over so, here, so <laughs> and then I would have made center the opposite direction. It would have been positive. So away from center would be negative. So away from center would be okay. um, negative, right. Negative, correct. All right, how much of that tension force is in the vertical direction? Uh, I suppose it would just be force tension cosine theta. And not negative force tension cosine theta. Okay, positive because it's pointing the same way as my y. Right, there's a lot of things you learn from doing these problems, right? You, you've done things a certain way and you haven't thought always about why because it becomes part of a sequence. Why do we do Newton's second law? Or why do we do, why do we bring the compound so we can apply Newton's second law? So acceleration toward the center is V or omega squared R, right? Acceleration in the Y direction is zero. So some of the forces toward the center is MAC substitute in and that's force tension cosine theta is equal to M omega squared R. Going to the other side, I have some of the forces in the y direction is equal to MAY, which gives me force tension sine theta minus mg equals zero. Why is your acceleration in y zero when the force of gravity is negative? Because I'm doing a, horror, a flat rotation, okay. so it's not accelerating upward or downward. Now, if you look at this, you may start to be concerned because I could solve this, for instance, for FT. And I could put that over here. Okay, you actually you probably you wouldn't be concerned, but you should be. <laughs> There I have an equation. Notice the mass of the bob actually is going to drop out for the angle, for the tension is still important. And we have something to find theta, but what is R? It's a measurement of distance, but it ain't L. It's not, notice now L was 0 0.85, and we have, here's L and here's R, here's theta. So R is equal to L cosine theta. And L is the variable I know. And so now you see, hey, I can cancel those cosine thetas out and solve this for sine theta is equal to G over omega squared L. Because um, I have to move sine theta up to there oh, yeah, and then omega yeah, squared yeah. L down to there. Okay, we're totally out of time. In fact, I'm four minutes over, so I'm going to stop here. We've done the work to find what the angle is. We would just put in numbers here and find the actual angle. And then once we found the angle, just come back up to this equation, actually to this equation, to find what the tension is. Or actually, since we know sine theta is, G over, we just put force tension is equal to. And so that, there we would have the force of tension, which actually, if I did things right, which I did this quickly, that's the same as we had for the tension before. It's a smaller angle or a smaller radius than the total length, but we have gravity involved. So we're out of time. That's 
all the problems we did is the same type of stuff for the general physics that we'll be talking about for the first time for them tomorrow. What was important and new today was the calculus of how we get the centripetal acceleration. See y'all at lab. Remember, do your lab quiz. I already did. Good Old man. Failed it.